so let's move on to uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. John McCary. And so uh, John is a professor of biology at the uh, University of Texas at San Antonio. And John has been working on the epigenetic control genesis, more specifically spermogenic cells uh, for many decades. And he has published uh, tons of papers in this area. And he's also involved in uh, a couple of projects that are highly relevant to uh, uh, the topic, the, the theme of this symposium. So John is going to talk about uh, uh, some latest data from his lab. John, all yours. Thank you, Wei. I want to thank you and Jill both for inviting me to speak. And let me just jump right into uh, my presentation. So I'm going to tell you a bit about some work we're doing uh, in spermatogenesis with respect to epigenetic regulation and epigenetic programming. Uh, but first, I want to sort of touch on the, the one of the primary topics of this meeting, and that is transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of environmentally induced epimutations, which I've had an interest in, uh, had the pleasure of collaborating with Mike Skinner on, on this for many years. Uh, and I think there's a, a few questions that are predominant in the field, not yet answered, uh, but, but certainly uh, pending all the time. One is, when are environmentally induced epimutations introduced into the germline? Another one is, how are environmentally induced epimutations introduced into the germline? And a third one is, how are environmentally induced epimutations sustained during, in the germline, given all the epigenetic reprogramming that's occurring? And this is a representation of the male germline uh, throughout life. Uh, and when we ask questions about when are environmentally induced epimutations introduced, at least into the male germline, and it can certainly be introduced into the female as well. Uh, but in the case of the male, uh, this is still an open question. You heard Mike Skinner talk in the previous session of this meeting, and he talked about uh, exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals that can induce uh, epimutations as early as primordial germ cells. You also heard Wei Yan talk in the last session about effects uh, that are directly impacting the sperm. Uh, so we have both ends of the male germ lineage uh, impacted potentially by environmental effects. And really, I think you have to consider that essentially any of these steps along the way are potential targets and that this remains an open question about exactly when the most sensitive times are uh, during uh, male germ cell development uh, for induction of epimutagenesis. Um, although I'll come back to one thought about primordial germ cells in, in a minute. Uh, the second question was how are environmentally induced epimutations, how do they get into the germline? And really all I can say about that is that's a very good question. Uh, far from answered in my mind. Uh, you heard Wei talk last week a bit about how non-coding RNAs could impact uh, programming in sperm potentially and in the embryo post-fertilization, but really in terms of the actual molecular mechanisms by which any sort of environmental effect is transduced into an actual epimutation, a molecular epimutation in the germline, I think that remains another very open question. Uh, and finally, then the question about how are environmentally induced epimutations sustained throughout the development of the germline and throughout the development of the germline in sequential generations, uh, even when, as, as Mike Skinner mentioned last week, you only have one initial exposure to the actual causative environmental effect, and yet the effects of that can be transmitted via epigenetic inheritance over multiple generations. And why is that so surprising? To me, the reason that's so surprising is that there is normally a large extent of epigenetic reprogramming that goes on during the life cycle of an individual. This is a, a, a schematic from Wolf Reich's lab. Whoops, sorry, there we go. Showing uh, what happens to DNA methylation during the life, life cycle of a mouse. And you can see on the left, you have the sperm and the egg coming together at fertilization. Much of the inherited uh, methylation, not all by any means, but much is eliminated uh, by the time you get to the blastocyst. I hope you can see a cursor here. And then there is a re global remethylation that occurs. And by the time you get to the stage of gastrulation, we, we have 
this remethylation. And this whole portion is what I like to refer to as embryonic reprogramming. And once you get to the gastrulus stage, that's going to give rise to both the somatic cells and the germ cells. And in the case of the somatic cells, we've got what I call somatic programming. Uh, it's just differences depending on the particular somatic cell type that is developing on a gene by gene specific basis. There are some changes in DNA methylation that, that predispose the unique transcriptomes in each uh, somatic cell type. But then in the germ cells, it is even more interesting because we have yet another very dynamic, whoops, sorry. Hold on, sorry. There, another very dynamic reprogramming event which involves another erasure of DNA methylation genome-wide, even more extensive than that which occurred in the blastocyst stage. And then sooner in the male or later in the female during gametogenesis, we have remethylation of those uh, genomes so that we can return to the state that starts the whole cycle over again. And interestingly, this, this creates this in the germline, unique to the germline, what has been termed the epigenetic ground state, which as you can see is essentially the lowest level of, of, of uh, programming that exists during the life uh, cycle of, a, of the mouse and presumably in other mammals, including humans. Uh, so one of the big questions to me, going back to the original question that led to this, we have these <clears throat> major phases of reprogramming. And if, if a, a, a epimutation or an environmentally induced epimutation is introduced to the next generation, it's going to have to go through all of these, this reprogramming. And one, at least myself, would have expected there could be ample opportunity for even though you had introduced an environmentally induced epimutation into the germline, uh, that it could be easily erased and then corrected by the reprogramming, the normal reprogramming. But lots and lots and lots of data now shows that there are many instances when that does not happen. And why this process doesn't correct those inherited epimutations is another open question as far as I'm concerned. So again, I can't give you an answer to that question either. But what I do want to tell you about is some of our work looking at the dynamics of male germ cell development and how it is regulated epigenetically. And first, let's just look at the developmental dynamics of male germ cell development. We start with primordial germ cells. That's the first type of germ cell that, that is allocated in the early embryo. And then those cells all develop into, in the male, what are called prospermatogonia, of which there are three types. These are M prospermatogonia, then there's T1 and T2 prospermatogonia. Those then give rise to undifferentiated spermatogonia in the testis. And a small subset of the undifferentiated spermatogonia form what we call the spermatogonial stem cells. And those are particularly interesting because it is the spermatogonial stem cells that give rise to all of the rest of the spermatogenic lineage, all the way up through spermatogonia, spermatocytes, spermatids, and sperm. So we're particularly interested in spermatogonial stem cells because unlike any of the other cell types before or after this stage in the male germ lineage, spermatogonial stem cells can self-renew. And so they can self-renew and they can also give rise to what are called progenitor spermatogonia, which are then able to give rise to the rest of the spermatogenic lineage. And the cool thing about spermatogonial stem cells is this process can happen over and over and over again. And so if we go back and look at the entire lineage, the first part of the lineage is a one-time event. We progress from primordial germ cells to prospermatogonia to spermatogonial stem cells. And as that progression goes, the preceding cell type disappears and they all convert into the subsequent cell type. Then though, we get to what we call steady state spermatogenesis and that is a repeating process. So this part of the lineage is repeated over and over and over again, wave after wave of spermatogenesis and that is how a healthy human man can produce 85 to 100 million sperm today, relevant to Jill's question about why are we looking at sperm more than eggs. 
There's a lot more sperm than there are eggs. So we have been particularly interested in this region of, of the lineage lately. Uh, and I'm just gonna blow that up for you. We start with prospermatogonia and in the prospermatogonia, there is specification of what become the foundational spermatogonial stem cells. And this we believe happens by virtue of initially epigenetic priming of spermatogonial stem cell fate and subsequently ep epigenetic activation of spermatogonial stem cell fate. And then after that, there is, as I mentioned, steady state spermatogenesis, which I'm just showing you the first part of here. But that involves a couple of different things, especially with respect to spermatogonial stem cells. We have, as I mentioned, maintenance of spermatogonial stem cell fate during self-renewal, or we have loss of spermatogonial stem cell fate coincident with priming of differentiation of, of spermatogonial differentiation, which then is activated to produce what we call differentiating spermatogonia that go on through the rest of the spermatogenic differentiation pathway. And so this first part is the one, the part that happens only once, and that happens in, in the fetal and prepubertal periods. And then the latter part is happening repeatedly during steady state spermatogenesis, and that's happening in the adult period. So we're particularly focused now on even a more specific part of this lineage, and that is spermatogonial stem cells and progenitors. Because when a spermatogonial stem cell divides, it can give rise to either spermatogonial stem cells, one or two, or progenitors. And we're wondering how these cell types differ, because there is a difference in cell fate. And we can actually demonstrate that thanks to a, a, a a measurement because spermatogonial stem cells retain and possess the regenerative capacity of self-renewal and stemness. And that can be functionally demonstrated by, by a transplantation assay that was developed by Ralph Brinster in the early 90s. We can take uh, cells from a donor, transgenically marked uh, a donor mouse, and inject them into the testis of a recipient that does not carry the marker transgene. And if there are functional spermatogonial stem cells among the cells that are injected into the testis of the recipient, they will seed new donor-driven spermatogenesis within the recipient, and you can get offspring that derive from the cells that came from the donor testis. And that can only happen via the presence of functional spermatogonial stem cells that were transplanted. So we have that assay. So spermatogonial stem cells have that potential. However, progenitors have lost that potential. So there's a significant functional difference between SSCs and progenitors. And as I mentioned, progenitors are on their way to, to initiating spermatogenic differentiation. And so if we ask about how these cell types differ molecularly, we can imagine that like in any other cell type, cell type or subtype specific fate and function are driven by differential gene expression. And we have the advantage of being able to selectively recover populations of SSCs or progenitors, thanks to uh, development of a transgenic mouse uh, uh, line by our colleague John Oatley at Washington State University, in which he uh, has a ID4 GFP transgene, where we can fax sort uh, bright cells that are, are spermatogonial stem cells and dim cells that are progenitors as validated by the transplantation assay. And so we've used that recently uh, with other colleagues uh, to study the, the unique trans transcriptomes of various different types of spermatogenic cell types in both mouse and human. And even more recently, specifically to compare spermatogonial stem cells and progenitors. And here is some bulk RNA-seq, and you can see there are obviously differences in gene expression. There are, there are many differentially expressed genes. We've also looked at it with single cell RNA-seq as well. Uh, and so what I wanna point out is these, have, these two cell types, SSCs and progenitors, have this very significant functional difference. However, uh, they're very closely related. After all, they both came from the same lineage and, and they've only very recently begun to even begun to di diverge. Uh, and so uh, 
what we found was we found about 600 genes that are upregulated in SSCs relative to progenitors and 490 uh, or 500 that are upregulated in progenitors. Uh, so it's, there, are, there is differential gene expression. It's not a huge num amount of differential gene expression, and we would not have expected it to be very much because they're very closely related. What regulates differential gene expression? It's a complex regulatory system that's heavily uh, 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 relies on epigenetic mechanisms. So we do have transcription factor networks, including non-coding RNAs and protein factors. Those function within two-dimensional chromatin landscapes, and that is all regulated by three-dimensional interactomes, especially establishing promoter enhancer loops within the genome in unique patterns that are cell type specific. And so we've been studying, in particular, looking at spermatogonial stem cells and progenitors, the two-dimensional chromatin landscapes and how they might differ in the two spermatogonial subtypes. Uh, and we've looked at DNA methylation patterns, histone modification patterns, and chromatin accessibility patterns. And this, by looking at all three of these, allows us to take an approach that's been called multi-parametric integrative analysis. And we didn't invent this. This has been going on for some time, actually. This is essentially the approach that was taken by the ENCODE uh, consortium and also by the NIH Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium. And, uh, they have analyzed well over 100 different cell types, looking at characterizing many, many different epigenetic parameters and putting all that data together to get a true picture of epigenetic programming that is unique to each different cell type. And now even more recently, there's the International Human Epigenome Consortium, the goal of which is to, to characterize 1,000 different reference epigenomes, which will be very nice when it's all said and done. But we go back to this one, this is ENCODE, and here they're talking about looking at well over 100 different uh, cell types for which they, they per, uh, profiled the epigenomes, but among those, they were all somatic cell types, no germ cells anywhere to be found. And why that is, I've asked a couple of these guys and I can't get a good answer so far, but I think we're finally convincing them to start taking a look at germ cells as well. But in the meantime, we've been looking at this uh, at germ cells in this way. Uh, and so we've, going back to comparing spermatogonial stem cells and progenitors, we've looked in the genic regions and we are able to compare, as I told you, we can separate the, the SSCs and the progenitors. So in each case, the tracings that are in the red color are SSCs and those in the blue color are progenitors. And we, what we did was to make several aliquots of samples of the same uh, purified cell types, and then we analyzed them for five different histone modifications by CHIP-seq, for chromatin accessibility by ATAC-seq, for DNA methylation by MEDIP-seq, and for gene expression by RNA-seq. And the nice thing is, because these are aliquots of the same samples, they are all directly comparable to one another. And that allows us to take this multi-parametric approach. And so what you can see over here is, that by clustering analysis, we could divide these into theoretically seven different clusters. Uh, and if we look at these, the, the clusters one, two, three, and four plus six are expressed genes, and clusters five and seven are not expressed or very lowly expressed genes. Uh, and interestingly, if we look at these, for the most part, regardless of whether the genes are expressed or not, they're showing peaks of uh, methylation at lysine 4 of histone H3, whether it's mono, di, or tri methylation. Uh, they're also showing open chromatin configuration, at, and this is at the promoter region in each case. And they're showing a reduction in DNA methylation specifically at the promoter regions. Uh, and in the case of the genes that are expressed, we see enrichment of, of histone H3 lysine 27 acetylation and a depletion of histone H3 lysine, uh, excuse me, lysine 27 trimethylation, or vice versa. In the case of the genes that are repressed, there's an enrichment of the K27 trimethylation and a depletion of that in the, the uh, um, a depletion of K27 acetylation. And I already told you about this part. So what we found was 
particularly important about the genes that are differentially expressed between spermatogonial stem cells and progenitors, a lot of the epigenetic parameters are similar because these are genes that are just on or off. They're toggling between being on or off in these two very closely related cell types. And so we have many epigenetic parameters that are similar, but K27 acetylation and K27 trimethylation seem very uh, important as a toggle switch for genes that are on or off in each of these two particular subtypes. And so we also looked in intergenic regions. Whoops, sorry, this thing keeps jumping on me. And so these are typically enhancer regions, and we recognize those by the presence again of uh, K4 methylation and also uh, chromatin accessibility and also an absence of DNA methylation. And then you can divide enhancers into active, poised, or primed enhancers. And those are typically characterized by what's going on again with K27 acetylation and K27 trimethylation. Active tends to have acetylation but not trimethylation. Poised typically have both. We didn't see too much of the K27, but typically poised have presence of both of those uh, marks enriched. And primed typically have an absence of either of those kinds of marks. The point being, again, you can identify these putative enhancer regions and you can subdivide them categorically according to active, poised, or primed. And so when we did that and we compared SSCs and progenitors, I think this really shows you what's going on. Here we have the SSCs and progenitors, and either they're self-renewing and maintaining their SSC fate, or they're initiating the differentiation process by becoming progenitors. And what that means is they're just starting to separate from one another uh, in terms of their fate and in terms of their epigenetic programming. And so you can see that there are a lot of the enhancers are similar in both cell types, but we do see certain enhancers, be they active, poised, or primed, that are unique to SSCs or unique to progenitors in each case. What's very, I think, very cool about this whole multi-parametric integrative approach is that when you look at a lot of different epigenetic parameters simultaneously in the same cell type, preferably in aliquots of the same cell uh, samples. It's like a code that you can put together. And this was, again, derived by, developed by the ENCODE folks. But you can, you can recognize up to 15 different chromatin states uh, by virtue of essentially the different combinations of enrichment or lack thereof of these various different uh, epigenetic marks. And so it really gives a great deal of power uh, to looking into epigenetic programming, I think at a, at a whole different level than what many of us have done for many years when we're looking at one or another particular individual epigenetic uh, uh, parameter. And so the other thing I want to show you is that you can, you, another way to look at this and integrate this data is you can use these genome browser-like tracks. And this is doing an overlapping or overlaying signaling uh, uh, presentation so if we look down here, the, the sort of uh, coral color signal, that comes from spermatogonial stem cells. The green comes from progenitors. If there's overlapping, you put those two, two colors together, you get brown, all right? And we look, this is the same region of the genome look, looking at peaks of all these different kinds of, of either uh, um, chromatin marks or specific factor marks. In this case, we were looking at the RAB4A gene, which is just an example of a gene that is upregulated in spermatogonial stem cells. And here we have the promoter, and here we have the enhancers. And what you can see, as I've told you before, remember that the, the coral color is what's going on in, in spermatogonial stem cells. This gene is upregulated in spermatogonial stem cells. Here we've got um, uh, K27 acetyl. And here you see that is higher in spermatogonial stem cells, correlating with this gene being upregulated in spermatogonial stem cells. And if we look at an op oh, and if we look in at, at the repressive signal, it's actually higher in progenitors because this gene is downregulated in progenitors. And then if we look at sort of the opposite situation, which is to look at a gene that's upregulated in progenitors, now we see higher representation of K27 acetyl in the progenitors and higher representation of the repressive mark 
K27 trimethyl in the spermatogonial stem cells. So just another way to look at this, and we don't have time to go into all these others, but you can correlate all of these things with one another. So it's a very nice and powerful approach. Once you've done that and you've identified important regions in the genome where there appear to be all this there appears to be all this epigenetic programming going on, you can look at motifs, potential binding sites for factors, and you can do what's called motif enrichment analysis, and you can identify potential factors that may be involved in either regulating the epigenetic programming or being facilitated and enabled to function via the epigenetic programming. And so we've done that. I'm just trying to show you examples of what can be done. Uh, and we, you can look at enhancers, and you can look, for instance, at active enhancers, poised enhancers, primed enhancers, and look for regions that show differences in enrichment depending on uh, which cell type you're looking at. Uh, and so this, these are just ways one can um, devise different candidate regulators, factors that could be regulating the epigenetic programming process. And once you have some of those, if you like, you can go in in, in C2 and look to see if there are differential representation of those factors in different sp specific spermatogonial subtypes, which we see here. I don't have time to go through them in detail, but this is all uh, now in press and iScience, so you can take a look at it in detail. And the other thing you can do is you can make predictions about if, in fact, these factors are regulating target genes and you saw certain motifs for those factors associated with genes that are differentially expressed in the two cell types, you might predict that the factors should be differentially bound to the target either enhancer or promoter regions of, in the two cell types of the same gene. And that's what we're showing you here. These are three of our favorite uh, factors that we think might be uh, important for regulating some of the differences in gene expression in spermatogonial stem cells and progenitors. And this basically is showing you by chip, by factor specific and locus specific chip, that indeed there, there are differences in the binding activities of certain of the factors that are predicted by the motif enrichment analysis. And so coming back to the question of, of how do SSCs and progenitors differ, uh, we can predict that there's going to be differential gene expression. And we would argue we've now shown that we would predict that there's going to be differences in epigenetic programming. I showed you data for two-dimensional chromatin landscapes being different, so we've shown that. Via the motif enrichment approach, we're beginning to look at transcription factor network differences. We're certainly not finished with that. And after that, next on the list, we'll be looking at 3D interactome effects, trying to put all of this together to really get a comprehensive picture of how the epigenetic programming is working. And so I just want to end by, by pointing out that, that via epigenetic programming, you can start by establishing what I would call permissive epigenetic landscapes. The gene may be on, it may be off, but it is set up to be easily turned on or off in this permissive state. Uh, and that can happen via hypomethylation of DNA, hypermethylation of histone H3, lysine 4, and increased chromatin accessibility. And then you can establish instructive epigenetic signals. And in our, in our data, that, would, that seems to be um, the, if you want to turn a gene on, hypomethylation of histone H3K27 and acetylation of histone H3K27. Uh, and then, of course, there's going to be establishment of promoter enhancer interactions. And all of this, we think, is either directing transcription factor binding or is facilitated by transcription factor binding. And so coming back just to bring this full circle, how are environmentally induced epi mutations introduced into the germline molecularly? I don't know the answer, but I would bet you it's got a lot to do with the kinds of parameters that I just described to you and disrupting those. And how, do they, how are they sustained through, through development of the, uh, of the germline, through these two major waves of reprogramming, that one I really can't answer, but why they're not erased and reset, but that's something we certainly want to follow up on. And so with that, I'll just thank our funding sources, the Clayberg Foundation, the Heard Foundation, and NICHD. And this is our uh, COVID compliant uh, lab photo here uh, that I'll show you. <laughs>
And I want to particularly draw attention to one uh, ass assistant research professor in my lab, Curran Cheng. He did all of the epigenomic profiling uh, work that I showed you today. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. All right. Oh, thank you, John. This is a wonderful. It's great. Uh, so we do have one question here. It's very quick. Uh, uh, we have like about two minutes. So are genes upregulated because they have H3K27 acetylation or H3K4 trimethylation, or do genes have these histone modifications because they're upregulated? I think this is like a chicken egg type of question. Well, Which yes, one? but but um, let me let me put myself back on. But as I said toward the end, I think there are modifications that set up essentially a permissive state of chromatin. And they're allowing the switch to be, to be switched. And then I think there are other modifications that are more directly involved in, in, in the switch. So things like uh, methylation of histone H4, that seems to contribute to the permissive state. Things like changes between acetylation or trimethylation of K27, that seems to be more closely related to the actual switch on or off of the gene or up and down or down. Okay, great. So we have one more question and then we're going to do that. So did you see expression differences in genes regulating the addition or removal H3K27 acetylation and H3K27 trimethyl? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very logical and, and good question. And that's something we're going to look at. Uh, some of that should be uh, we, we should be prompted by the motif enrichment analysis to see some of those. But of course, we know what some of the, the writers and readers uh, and erasers of some of those marks are anyway. So it would make sense to look at differential expression of some of those factors. And that's certainly on our to-do list. Yeah, John, I think that we're running out of time. However, I just want to give, to give you like a 20 seconds uh, to start like, because uh, um, people always think that, I, I, by the way, I like your approach, this uh, multi, you know, parameters type of thing. And it really gave you an uh, overall picture of the epigenetic changes. And, but a lot of people criticize that this is like a, a, a profile analysis, it's correlative, it's not magnetic. And how do you, um, you know, uh, counter that type of... Uh, um, I, I, yes, I, I've certainly heard that. <laughs> and I've been known to, 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 to cast the same question to others. But you do have to know what's going on normally to begin with uh, and before you can ask how what the mechanism is to create it. You have to know what, what it is if you want to know how it works. Uh, and so the idea is understand the profiling completely as, as complete as possible to begin with and then go in and figure out what is creating that profiling, especially what's creating the differences uh, in different su uh, subtypes of cells. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, so, thank you. Great.